everyone. Welcome to panel one of Public Health Research Day. I'm Dr. Cynthia Bauer of the Horowitz Center for Health Literacy here at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. And I'm joined by a really exciting group of uh, panelists and a co-moderator, William Tilburg, who is the exec executive director of the Maryland Medical Cannabis Commission. We're here today to help guide a conversation on health misinformation causes and consequences for public health research and action. And we know that there was a spotlight on communication issues and misinformation in the opening session today. And we hope to really deepen and extend that conversation with the panel that we have here today. So just briefly, I'll give you a, a quick introduction. Their biographies are uh, on the um, conference website so you can learn more about them there. But just quickly, we're joined today by Dr. Gunther Eisenbach. Uh, who is executive editor at JMIR Publications and also an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria. We are uh, joined also by Kathleen Hoke, who is professor at the Maryland Carey Law School and director of the Network for Public Health Law for the Eastern Region. Dr. Michelle LaRue, who is director of Health and Human Services at Casa de Maryland. And then Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, who is a senior fellow in Governance Studies and the Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. So we have a fabulous lineup here for you today. Our panelists are each going to speak for about 10 minutes and uh, Will Tilburg will also be doing double duty and functioning as a panelist. So each person will speak for about 10 minutes and you can answer or uh, post your questions or comments in the Q&A and we'll be uh, monitoring that and then we will turn to those questions and comments after our panelists have each given opening remarks. So I do want to acknowledge our sponsors for Public Health Research Day. Uh, here they are on this slide, the University of Maryland School of Public Health, the University of Maryland School of Medicine, the Maryland Public Health Association, the Public Health Commission Officers Corps, and Empowering the State, and uh, Delta Omega. So thank you all very much for sponsoring uh, this activity here today. And with that, we will turn to our opening speaker, Dr. Eisenbach. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, I hope my screen is visible with the slides. Um, so my name is Gunter Eisenbach. I am a adjunct professor at the University of Victoria in Canada and based in Toronto. And I'm also, um, founder and publisher of Jamie Publications, which is a, a small scholarly publisher with an emphasis on digital health. So I, there, wanna... I wanna stop you because we can't see your slides. Oh dear. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? We can see you, but we can't see the slides. All right. Uh, I... Okay, now the slide sharing is working. All right. Okay, so I wanted to talk uh, briefly about a new or not so new discipline, um, which I called 20 years ago, infodemiology. And I used that term uh, for the first time in 2002 when I wrote an editorial um, for a paper where authors looked at certain markers, certain technical markers of quality on a, on a website and, and tried to make predictions on the content accuracy based on these technical qual uh, quality criteria. And it occurred, it occurred to me that this is very similar to what we do in clinical epidemiology. So looking at symptoms and, and making predictions on, on conditions and so on. So uh, it occurred to me that there's a new field emerging here, uh, which I call infodemiology. And at the time I, I framed this in the context of misinformation and has the concept or the definition of the field has since expanded a little bit. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. But back then the uh, definition was that this is a new research discipline and methodology uh, the study of determinants and distribution of health information, uh, information epidemiology or infodemiology. So the, one reason why the definition of this term was expanded a little beyond 
information quality or misinformation is that in, in medicine and in many other fields, quality is really a very elusive concept. Especially in medicine, uh, we often don't know what the truth is. I mean, there are clinical trials out there, or there are other there, there's research, there's tons of research out there on certain questions. But research, as we all know, is sometimes conflicting, and it is often simply not clear what is correct and what isn't. Uh, especially in in the absence of systematic reviews or clinical trials, and that was especially visible in in the early months of, of COVID, and it, it is still a problem, obviously, uh, that, that we often don't have that information and uh, the best evidence may also change over time. So uh, the, a more, the, the working definition here of quality and misinformation is that it's, it's a gap between the best evidence on, on the one side and what people do or disseminate as, as a truth on the other side. Uh, and um, to, to study this, and we can use the internet to study this. We can use the internet to study what do people do, what do they think, what are they searching for? And so the methodolo methodological basis for epidemiology is um, studying internet information and there's a supply side to this. So what do people post? Uh, on websites, on social media, and but there's also a demand side to it, so we can also study what are people searching for, and then we can uh, make predictions for public health. So, infodemiology as a research discipline really goes beyond studying misinformation. So this is one special special use case that we study, like what is the amount of misinformation out there. Uh, um, but misinformation and, and other data out there um, really reflects the knowledge and behavior and attitudes of, of people and knowledge, behavior and attitudes have a public health impact. So if we study those, uh, what is out there, uh, what, what do people know, what are they looking for, how do they behave, if we use internet data for that, uh, we can um, study these relationships and uh, also attempt to make predictions. So in this framework, um, so traditional epidemiological methods measure what is like what's the prevalence of disease out there, what is the prevalence of risk factors, et cetera. Based on that, public health professionals and policy makers make uh, policy decisions and create public health interventions, which hopefully in turn uh, change population behavior, attitudes, health status, which in turn should change um, epidemiological markers. Um, but to study all this takes time and uh, we can more directly measure this or in a more timely manner when we study information and communication patterns on the internet to study, for example, what is the uptake of public health interventions, communication interventions, and so on. And so that is the field of epidemiology, which is an additional, um, an additional um, metric or which provides additional data for public health professionals and policymakers to study the impact of interventions. Um, another example for infodemiology study is to, to use, uh, to use um, information that is out there, in particular search information. So what are people searching for to uh, make predictions for public health relevant events. So I started studying this in, in 2006. Um, when we found that there was a correlation between internet searches and influenza outbreaks. And um, that was later uh, also um, implemented by, by Google as, as Google Flu Trends. Um, so that's one example on how internet information can create uh, markers or, or metrics that have uh, public health relevance. Um, we also started social media, we started start, uh, 
studying social media and um, people sometimes say COVID is the first pandemic in which uh, misinformation and infodemics became uh, a topic, but the reality is we had a pandemic already with the H1N1 uh, pandemic uh, about 10 years ago. And um, we, we started, uh, we, we, we used social media um, analytics to study what people are saying, what are they sharing, what are their personal experiences, how are their personal experiences correlated with, with outbreak information. And uh, that was another early um, kind of proof of concept study and, and how we can use those uh, methods to uh, inform policy makers and public health professionals. So in 2020, so last year with COVID-19, WHO has recognized that uh, using these methods and fighting what WHO now calls an infodemic um, is, a, is a key pillar in, in fighting in a pandemic. So uh, last year, WHO created a, um, a consultation, uh, had a consultation meeting and, and the results of that were published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research um, as a framework for managing the COVID-19 infodemic. And um, I published an editorial um, and um, also hi and highlighted four, four pillars, which I think are um, important to look at when we fight an infodemic. So the first piece here is information monitoring, also sometimes called social listening or infovalence. So that means policymakers, public health professionals should have the tools to kind of monitor in real time what's going on, on out there, what people are sharing, what they're talking about, where the misinformation outbreaks. Um, the other aspect is um, I, I drew this information cake model um, to uh, highlight the fact that there are there's information on different levels. For example, there's information out there on the on the in the science domain. For example, preprints which are not peer reviewed. There are there's information in the news media. There's information in the social media, and to translate information, for example, from the science level to the news level um, knowledge translation processes are required um, and, and knowledge translation is sometimes influenced by politics, by commercial influences um, and so on. So that's, that's another angle to, to study the knowledge translation process. e has literacy is, is another uh, important pillar, I'm sorry. Um, that means uh, we need to uh, train the public to make good choices and in, in selecting the information. And then the last uh, quadrant here is fact checking or peer review. So within each of these layers of this cake, um, there are typically mechanisms and processes to ensure that information is correct. So in science, we have peer review, for example, as a mechanism. Uh, news media have uh, fact checkers and, and things like that. And, and to encourage those processes is another pillar to fight infodemics. Um, well, Gunther, I'm gonna ask you I to, to wrap up to my here. minutes. So thank you very much, Cynthia. I'm gonna pass on to the next speaker. Great, so thank you very much for giving us that framework for thinking about the information environment. And Dr. Turner Lee is going to continue uh, that and also uh, give us her perspective on how technology in particular is really uh, affecting this information environment that we're all trying to navigate through. So welcome Dr. Turner Lee. Well, thank you for having me and I'm happy to be part of this conversation. Uh, this is not a normal discussion that I'm normally invited to as a technologist. Um, I'm the director of the Center for Technology at the Brookings Institution, but my work often undergirds the intersection between race, technology, and social justice. So of course, I have a lot to say when we begin to think about where we are in this pandemic and the extent to which misinformation and disinformation is essentially eroding the trust in the medical system and in many respects, sort of regurgitating the narratives around medical racism. 
that have impacted vulnerable populations for decades. And so what I'd like to do as a technologist is you know, provide a historical perspective just in my opening remarks, and also provide some background on the technology and why it's important to mix and match the technology with where we are today, especially as we look at the uh, widespread um, concern for vaccination among all populations and who we know in this country is not being vaccinated at equal rates to whites. I mean, clearly, let me start here, that the virus didn't discriminate. I mean, I think if we look back at the mortality rates of this virus, we would be in the kind of distress that we are in today that we cannot end it without some type of cure to um, basically slow down the progression and the spread. But at the same token, this comes with some consequences to particular communities. Uh, in particular, we saw that African-Americans, Latinos, and tribal uh, residents were most affected by, by COVID-19. And that was not just due to pre-existing medical conditions, but as my colleague Rashawn Ray, actually of the University of Maryland suggests, it also came because of the housing conditions that people lived in, low-income people living in close proximity, high density housing. It came as a result of the work that many of these populations were actually engaged in, frontline work that actually placed them at a disadvantage. It came as a result of the lack of quality healthcare. Uh, and you know, I would also suggest the lack of trustworthiness in the medical care systems that were available. If you combine all of that, then that actually explains the disproportionate impact and outcomes of why vulnerable populations and those who have been historically marginalized were on the higher end of this disease. I personally, as an African-American, lost several family members to COVID-19 in this last year. And as we move now towards vaccination, it's, it equally should not be a secret as to why the people who have been most affected by this virus are also the least likely to be vaccinated. Now, I could spend a lot of time here talking about the historical narratives that we are all pretty much familiar with. And if you are not, let me remind you. And that is just the medical racism that has existed for vulnerable populations over the years. We know in the 1930s, the syphilis project at Tuskegee was one that began to develop this mistrust when Black men were injected with syphilis as part of experimentation. We have also heard, or some of us have heard about Henrietta Lacks, who was never compensated for the use of her DNA when it came to identifying cures for cancer. And we also know from the policy perspective, because that's the world in which I sit, that Black and Latina and tribal land folks are rarely representative in clinical trials. So if you combine those factors in the narratives, why I'm starting here is that it lays out the blind spots, the vulnerabilities that actually become the target of misinformation. And I think if we trail the history of misinformation in this country in the last you know, few years, we saw similar attacks on vulnerable populations when it came to the 2016 election. The type of information around the dissuading of people to vote simply because the foreign operatives knew the so discord that actually occurred in this country to set us in polar opposites when it came to our democracy, the best way to actually tear that fabric were to get those folks who had the least confidence in a political system. Well, guess what? That same historical narrative is playing out in the medical community. The folks that are least likely to be vaccinated in many respects, if you listen to the news carefully, may not have even lived during the Tuskegee experiment, but do remember the historical trails of what that deception made them feel like. And that, my friends, is where misinformation actually becomes part of the uh, course of um, fray when we're trying to get to some ends, I think, around this conversation in the pandemic. As my colleague spoke earlier about just the, the way that information is dispensed within the metal community, let me just share with you how information gets um, dispersed in the technological environment. We have in these systems, in these social media platforms, developed what I call algorithmic communities communities that basically aggregate us by our likes, our affinity groups, our taste, our interests. And more than likely, we don't know anybody else besides people who look like us, suggesting that the same type of groups that are established externally actually show up online. Those machine learning algorithms rest upon the repetitive nature of activities. And they've also allowed social media platforms become to become optimized marketing platforms, allowing for micro engagement in ways that can be both helpful and destructive. And so when you tie that to COVID, 
what you are essentially seeing are communities that by not by happenstance, but by the nature of the external associations that they have that are replicated in technology, getting amplified messages on why they should not be vaccinated or why you know, conspiracy theories like Hank Aaron, who was a, a famed baseball player, died from COVID. Again, creating that vaccine fear among these communities or getting messages. I was reading just the other day about a pamphlet because let me just be clear, misinformation has always existed among vulnerable populations when it comes to medical uh, instances. But pamphlets have now been digitized and the enablement enablement of algorithms to identify like-minded people, particularly people who are vulnerable, much like the 2016 election, much like other conspiracy theories, allows these algorithms to sort of amplify those messages and make it harder for us because of the opaqueness of online communities to really break that cycle. I did a study a couple of years ago where we used uh, network analysis to determine how many people actually associate online with people who are not like them. And what we found was that we've created these filter bubbles, experiences where our likes, our interests, our empathy and apathy all lay itself together. I, I try to, in layman's terms, and I'll start wrapping up here, kind of compare it to a playground. On the playground, there are monkey bars, there are slides, there's a sandbox, there are swings. And in the new algorithmic economy that rests its laurels on social media platforms, the white supremacists may be on the swings, the Black, Matter, like Black Lives Matter activists may be in the sandbox. The cyclists may be sitting over on the monkey bars and we're all in the same community with the type of information that we have grown to associate with becoming amplified. So my friends, I want to say as part of misinformation that that stream of content can lend itself to the type of bias and racism that we see exhibit in society. Large portion of my work at Brookings is looking at these cycles of algorithmic bias and where they actually have the unintended consequence of isolating or further uh, discriminating or deepening the systemic inequalities among certain populations. And so as I wrap up, I just would like to sort of frame this as we go into this conversation later, that technology in many respects is the culprit <laughs> of the same type of vices that have gotten us to this space where we are polarized nationally and we still rely upon some of the echo chambers of narratives that in many realities are true narratives in terms of how people feel when it comes to healthcare systems. But we also have a challenge going forward because how do you break the resiliency and the bond of these amplified messages that really spout misinformation and disinformation to those populations again who are more susceptibility to some of these um, vulnerable uh, risk factors. And so I will end there because I think there's a lot for us to talk about, but I do uh, want to stress, you know, in the company of medical professionals that I am not, I am a PhD in sociology. I cannot give you a prescription, nor can I talk about public health the way that my colleagues can. But what I can talk about, and I think it was sort of suggested in the previous uh, presentation, is that we've got a challenge because this information flow, these information flows are going to deepen and get stronger and will, in many respects, violate, I think, some of the democratic principles that we're striving for. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're only two speakers in and so many things that I'd love to, to probe on, but we'll keep going through our speaker list and get to our Q&A. So next we're going to have Professor Hoke, who, uh, like Dr. Turner Lee, is going to remind us that misinformation isn't new. Uh, her area of expertise is in the tobacco industry. Tobacco has a long, the tobacco industry has a long history of uh, doing some of the uh, deceptive marketing practices that Dr. Turner Lee alluded to. So Professor Hoke, we're very pleased that you could join us and help ground us in uh, uh, your own perspective on how misinformation takes hold and, and uh, spreads. Thank you, Cynthia. And I take to heart um, Dr. Um, or Nicole, um, what you said, and I'm going to find you on Twitter and we will become Twitter friends so, because I don't know anything about what you do. <laughs> so, I too am not a medical professional, but I don't even like to say the word algorithm because it scares me. Um, so thank you for already helping me make a new Twitter friend today. Um, 
So I want to situate things with, you know, what does misinformation look like with respect to tobacco products? And I'm going to look at vape products because we have 10 minutes, not 10 hours. Um, so let me situate you first with what vape products are. You know, they're Juul and um, uh, e-cigarettes, whatever name um, you like to put on them. We call them vape products um, most commonly now um, in the industry. They are relatively new. Um, as a consequence, we don't have a tremendous amount of scientific information or data um, about the impact that they have on um, the human body. Certainly not long-term information, even lacking some short-term information and information about the impact across demographics. So in this world of limited science, we have kind of competing responses in public health. Some folks saying, adopt the precautionary principle. These are called e-cigarettes and cigarettes are the devil. Um, and so we should ban these products. We should, all the messaging should be about um, how these products are just as bad for you um, as cigarettes. So beware of them. Um, on the other hand, there is the, um, you know, a significant problem that we are desperate for smoking alternatives for folks who are dependent or dependent on or addicted to nicotine. Um, nicotine replacement therapy, the FDA approved medications are only modestly effective. Um, snus or other harm reduced um, products are again, um, only moderately um, effective, particularly in the United States. And so um, we have the other side of the coin saying, well, we might as well try something because you know, anything is better than smoking. Um, and so that's the world in which we actually are living from a science perspective, but also from a public health messaging perspective. This contributes, of course, to consumer vulnerability to misinformation. So there's disinformation that we know the industry is participating in, but there's also a good deal of this misinformation that's not intended um, to be harmful and not intended to spread um, uh, falsities, um, but often spread by folks who truly believe the message messaging that they're giving, but that messaging is based on anecdote. Um, it is at the very least misleading, if not false. Um, and it's really, again, owing to this lack of scientific knowledge. So what do we know from the research in the field right now on the misinformation um, about vape marketing or uh, vape communications? Um, you know, first we'll look at the online world, then we'll look at brick and mortar, mortar and then we'll talk about maybe policy options um, to correct for the misinformation. So in a 2020 commentary in the American Journal of um, Public Health, um, the um, uh, authors point out the significant harm that can come from the misinformation associated with vaping. So as I indicated, there's the one arm that is saying vaping is just as harmful as combustible cigarettes. Um, it's simply not true, um, though some truly believe that it is. But most importantly, what is the harm of that misinformation here? Well, it may deter some smokers um, from what we call switching. That's not cessation, that's not moving away um, from tobacco products or nicotine entirely, um, but it is switching to a harm reduced product, a product that we have reason to believe presents less risk of harm. And so that's the you know, kind of negative public health implication of the um, danger warning. Um, and then we have folks kind of again on the other end of the spectrum saying, well, vapes are nothing but harmless um, water vapor that you're consuming and they, you know, the, 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 the chemical profile is so different than cigarettes that you shouldn't be concerned about them at all. And obviously this is simply not true. And most principally ignores two things. First, um, the addictive nature of nicotine, regardless of how it is consumed um, and the impact particularly on young people, because we know um, that youth uptake of vaping products has been um, tremendous, um, disappointing and really cutting against gains that we were having with reducing youth um, tobacco use otherwise. Um, so those authors kind of have pointed out um, the harms of this misinformation. Then we look to a 2021 study. It was actually a systematic review of studies out there about health misinformation, right? So they looked at the six major categories where there is health information out there, vaccines, drugs or smoking, non-communicable diseases, pandemics, this is actually before COVID, um, uh, eating disorders and medical treatments. And they found that health misinformation was most prevalent in the drugs or smoking category. That 22, at least, um, uh, that 22 percent of the misinformation, um, I, I'm messing this up, so I'm not going to go there, um, but it is um, the highest 
uh, most prevalent form of health mis misinformation out there. Most of that was on the side of downplaying the health risks associated with vaping. So communications that vaping is not harmful um, at all. They also found a significant use in this particular category of bots that appear to be coming from a scientific profile. So the online profile appeared to be scientific, but they were bots spread it, spreading this mis misinformation as you know, contrasting with um, individuals actually um, and community members on the vaccine side of things, the other high area of misinformation. Um, and as well as folks who were touting um, vapes as um, uh, cessation devices when they're not approved as such. So there certainly is information out there that tells us, yep, we have a deep concern about the misinformation associated um, with vaping that's going on in the community in social media. Now let me tell you about the brick and mortar shops because it's equally important. Um, there was an April 2021, this month study, so I changed my presentation accordingly, that said, that looked at vape shop employees and the messaging that they're giving to consumers. And again, we're gonna call this misinformation instead of disinformation because the study also tells us that about at least 50% um, of these employees have no training, no understand, they have not studied the science behind um, you know, vaping or they have, and a super majority of them, or had only read pro-vaping messaging that they received from their boss or from the industry um, that they're involved in. And so um, these folks in either a vacuum of knowledge or with one-sided knowledge are providing misinformation. I don't know that it is intentional. I don't wanna say it's intentional, but they are simply providing information based on anecdote about, again, the health harms, um, as well as the, um, uh, the ability to quit, um, calling it quitting um, and achieving cessation when you transfer from smoking onto vaping. And so the data did find um, significant misinformation coming at the brick and mortar stores. So what are we to do about this? We know that online we have tremendous misinformation on both sides of the coin um, for vape products and at brick and mortar stores, we are deeply concerned about the messaging that consumers are getting in that one-on-one -on -one, um, encounter. From a policy perspective, much easier to respond to the brick and mortar store situation, right? So whether it is requiring education and training of folks who are gonna be selling these products, um, as well as um, regulation of what they are permitted to say in that regulated environment. So the First Amendment um, comes into play, but less significant when it comes to a regulated environment like that. And then you would have you know, enforcement checks to make sure um, that retailers, that vape shop vendor folks are saying the right things to folks or not um, get providing misinformation. You could also have corrective signage in the location that makes sure we're communicating, the public health community is communicating um, the right things, the true information or what our you know, best knowledge that we have um, about the health implications of, of vaping is. When it comes to the social media side of things, it is such, the WWW stands for Wild Wild West, right? There is a, you know, a tremendous amount of difficulty in regulating in that environment. There's federal law that protects the platforms from lawsuits based on what um, users um, say. Um, and then there's the First Amendment that of course pushes back on that. So I'm not so sure we'll see um, space there. Um, but then again, the bottom line becomes counter messaging. So using public health resources, which can be expensive, but the social media platforms make it a little bit easier, but countering with counter messages that say, again, the best information that we have now um, about vaping. So I hope that tied things up for you about, you know, um, the social media, the brick and mortar and some policy options for kind of cutting against the misinformation that's out there with respect to vape products. Thank you. So kudos, kudos for packing so much information into your 10 minutes, Professor Hope. That was fabulous. A fabulous tour through vaping. So now we're going to have Will Tilburg give us another um, sort of topic area specific example. Uh, he is the executive director of the Medical Marijuana Commission here in Maryland. So he's going to talk to us for uh, his 10 minutes about misinformation issues related to medical marijuana. And then we'll conclude with Dr. LaRue, who's gonna give us an on the ground community-based perspective of how this is all playing out in the community where she works. So, Will. Yeah, great, thank you, Cynthia. And thank you for carrying the water on this panel uh, in terms of putting putting everybody together. It's, it's been uh, fantastic to listen to so far. And um, 
And uh, I know that we, we were planning to do this last year and we had to hit the pause button. And so it's uh, 16 months later from when we first started talking, but I'm glad we were able to, to have this panel move forward today. And um, uh, I'm honored to be a part of it. So again, I'm Will Tilburg, the executive director for the Maryland Medical Cannabis Commission, which is the state's regulatory body for its legal medical cannabis market. I'm also an adjunct professor at the School of Public Health teaching health law and ethics course. Um, so thank you to the university, School of Public Health, for, for helping put on this event. Um, it's always something that I tune into, and so um, great to be a part of it this year. Uh, there was something that Kathy just talked about that, that spoke to me at the end in that 2021 study, how drugs are smoking are the, the number one area of misinformation. Um, so enter the drug guy. Uh, let's, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. And cannabis is an area that is particularly vulnerable to misinformation. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I think three of the most prominent are first, the rapid expansion in the United States of legal cannabis. So we have Maryland is now one of 35 states that has a legal medical cannabis market. In addition, there are now, as of last week, uh, 16 states in the District of Columbia that have legalized adult use. That all has occurred in the last 25 years. Um, California was the first state in 1996. So this is a tremendous amount of speed with which policy has changed. Um, and so that, that leads to a, a vacuum of information and, and folks vulnerable to misinformation. Second, that's exacerbated by the continued federal restrictions on cannabis, particularly restrictions on research. Um, so there, there is a, a healthy body of research on the health effects of cannabis, less so on the, the therapeutic uses, and even less so on dosing, administration, and specific products. Um, in, in Maryland alone, there are hundreds of different products that are available at, at the state licensed dispensaries, and there's inadequate research on, on many of them for proper uh, dosing and the like and, and long-term effects and uses. And then third is the breakneck speed at which the industry has grown across the country and continues to innovate. There are new products uh, every single day that, that come online here in Maryland and across the country. And there are resulting issues that come up every single day. And so it's sort of a, a perfect storm of, of misinformation. And so initially what I'm gonna use the most of my time today to talk about is, is a, a new issue that has come up. One of these new things that, that crops up that, that many of you may not be aware of yet. If you're not, you're going to be uh, shortly. And that is Delta 8 THC. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, there were articles uh, in the New York Times, Rolling Stone and Forbes about the booming Delta-8 THC market. Um, and so I'm gonna look at misinformation in the cannabis space through the lens of Delta-8 because this is something that's happening right now. Um, so when I evaluate it, I'll be looking at four questions. First, what is it? Uh, I suspect many of the folks here today don't have never heard of Delta-8 THC. Second, what are the potential risks to health and safety? Three, how has misinformation played a role in the proliferation of Delta-8? And then how do we counteract this, this misinformation as public policy and public health professionals. So first, what is it, and I, and I apologize, I'm gonna to have to rely a little bit more on notes than I usually prefer, but that, that reflects how, how recent this issue has come up, even, even to regulators. So cannabis, the plant, cannabis sativa plant has more than 100 cannabinoids within it. The most famous to date are THC, Delta-9 THC and CBD, but there's a lot more to the plant. Um, Delta-8 is another one of those, um, so it is THC but it's a different isomer. Um, and so it's less well-known and less studied. And within the plant itself, it really only occurs in very trace amounts. Um, the World Health Organization, there's limited study of Delta-8, but the World Health Organization estimates that it provides about 50 to 75% of the, the high of Delta-9. That is to say, it is psychoactive. Um, you will be impaired. You will get high if, if you ingest um, or uh, combust inhale uh, Delta-8. Um, because it exists in such small quantities, it wasn't an issue until recently. What changed was the 2018 Farm Bill, which legalized hemp. And the definition of hemp relates to the amount of uh, Delta-9 THC that you have within a plant. It doesn't uh, you know, take a look at Delta-8 or many other, other cannabinoids at all. Um, and so what that Farm Bill did was led to a proliferation of hemp farming across the country focused on CBD. And after that, CBD prices plummet. People are looking for ways to offload that product. 
one of the ways they figured out is you can convert CBD into Delta-8. So now this is, this is a cash cow. It's something that is uh, alleged to be legal because it's coming from legal CBD. It can get you high and there's a lot of it. Um, so we've seen the market now flooded as a result over the last, uh, really the last 12 to, to 24 months and ever increasing. So what are the potential risks then uh, to public health and safety? As I, as I referenced earlier, it's not well studied, it's not well understood, but it is psychotropic and impairing. That is, that is a recipe for uh, you know, a public health nightmare. And so that it is, it is alarming and there needs to be um, a focus on it from a policy perspective. Second is youth access. Um, the, the manufacturers of these products allege that since it comes from CBD that was uh, you know, originated from legal hemp, that the products themselves are legal, as a result, they're sold freely online and in brick and mortar stores and are not age restricted. So in Maryland, across the country, these products are being sold to teenagers, to others that have maybe no idea of uh, the psychoactive effects of, of the products or that there's even Delta-8 um, within them. And then third is testing. Uh, these products for hemp in, in the country are tested for THC, Delta-9 THC and CBD amounts, that's it. So. Um, there's not testing as to what contaminants maybe have gone onto the plants, so what pesticides were used, heavy metals in, in the processing, anything of the like. So there really is not a lot that's known as to what is in these products when they're hitting the shelves. And because of federal restrictions and, and slowness to react, uh, DEA and FDA, um, you know, they're, they're widely available and there hasn't really been any enforcement action. So then the third question is, how has misinformation played a role in the proliferation of Delta-8? Uh, first, it's from a legal misinformation standpoint, and that is clearly stating that these products are legal under federal and state law. Um, that is an open question at best, but there are dozens, if not more, companies that are selling this all across the country, and they prominently on their websites will say, this is legal, it comes from hemp, there's no issues. And Right now, state and federal regulators um, have not acted because of uh, a lack of clarity under, under federal law. Second, um, claims on the websites and in uh, patient testimonials that Delta-8 is safer and has less harmful effects than Delta-9. There's no, there's no good research on this. We can't say that for a fact, but it's commonly stated um, on these products. Three, a lot of therapeutic claims. Um, including that it helps with sleep or pain. Again, no studies demonstrating that, but that's why people are, are buying these products in addition to the high that's associated with them. And then lastly, a lot of patient testimonials. You see these on the websites, you'll see for the, for the manufacturers on social media, um, discussing the positive impacts of, of Delta-8, as well as how it's legal, uh, even though many of these folks sharing that are, are not necessarily legal experts. Um, so then I just wanted to read a couple of the, the different uh, things you can you can see on the on the website. The benefits of Delta-8 are very distinctive compared to THC counterpart Delta-9. Delta-8 is the perfect alternative for those who are sensitive or have bad have had bad reactions to Delta-9. If you suffer from nausea for any reason, Delta-8 soothes this problem without question. Never hungry? You'll have a tremendous appetite with this version of THC. Um, any discomfort you might feel from head to toe, Delta-8 is your, pat, your powerful natural option. Um, running out of time, there's a lot of other examples, um, but, but lastly, how do we counteract this? And it starts with the law. Uh, DEA can clarify that the transition from CBD to Delta-8, which is a synthetic process, is, makes it actually a synthetic cannabinoid. And if that's the case, then it would be still illegal under federal law and state and, and federal uh, enforcement agencies could, could shut down these manufacturers. Um, there needs to be research and testing on Delta-8 itself, it, not, it is not necessarily a bad thing um, if it has a, a less high and still relieves pain for individuals, but there's just not enough research on it yet. And then lastly, education. From bodies like uh, where I work, the Medical Cannabis Commission, other health regulatory agencies, getting the word out so folks are aware of this, so that parents are aware of it um, and, and can you know, and, and start discussions with policymakers about how to address. So with that, I'll, I'll try and keep this train on schedule, Cynthia, and, and pass okay. it along. Thank you, Will. So we've had two speakers talk to us about the broader information environment and technology, the role that technology plays. 
We've had two speakers talk to us about sort of the scientific gaps around these really important issues and how difficult it is for us to understand what the science may or may not be and sort of the, the policy and regulatory frameworks that make this all complicated. And now we're gonna to turn to Michelle LaRue who's trying to do all of this work in the community and I know has been very involved in COVID research and that COVID vaccine delivery. So giving us that perspective of what happens when you are just a regular old community member trying to make sense of all this, all this craziness. So thank you uh, for taking time away, Michelle, to join us for a little while. Uh, thank you. Um, I should take the computer down and have you interview. For, um, for those that don't know FASA, just to give a quick um, intro to who we serve and who we are, uh, we are a 30 plus year uh, community based organization. We serve the entire Mid Atlantic region uh, from Pennsylvania to Virginia um, with a lot of focus here. We started here in Maryland. Uh, we serve predominantly Spanish speaking and French speaking immigrants from Latin America and uh, West Africa. So we try to do everything trilingually. Um, but, you know, we're not homogenous even within um, just the Latin American or even within our own country, just like, you know, someone from New York is not the same as someone from Texas, just the accents alone uh, is different. Um, and so this, this plays into, into some of what uh, I'll be discussing in a little bit. Uh, we work primarily with low income community members um, and that lack uh, health insurance. And so that also plays a, a, a role a little bit in, in my talk. Um, reaching the community we've done um, throughout the pandemic. So whether we're talking about vaccine research or, or even the latest phases, um, talking about um, the, um, the research and, and all of the phases of the pandemic, we really um, have been employing the same modalities. It's the messaging itself that may change from phase to phase uh, or, or what, what the focus in is on for that particular day. But our community still, the best way to reach our community is still person to person. Um, so we have teams and teams of promotoras de salud or community health workers that have been going out into the community to do this research despite um, as Dr. Uh, Turner Lee was mentioning earlier, all the challenges uh, and risk factors that our community has uh, in place against us, um, many of us do uh, still go out and, and, and do this work face to face. Um, and so that has been and still is the most successful way to um, disseminate information to our community. And it's, it's really one of the most critical. Uh, we're able to get into in-depth conversations with community members. We're able to really gain the trust. Uh, many, uh, all I would say, uh, promotoras de salud are from the same community that they serve. And so this allows for much more open conversation, honest conversation to take place. So really talking about uh, what are you know, the reasons that there might be hesitation in the community or opening up about maybe some past traumas. Um, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Turner Lee mentioned, the Tuskegee uh, experiments, I mean, as morally repugnant as they were, it didn't keep them from repeating them in my own home country of Guatemala. Um, and so, you know, that lends itself to, to the mistrust uh, and the trauma that many of us feel um, from, you know, that we bring uh, to this experience, whether it's from our own home governments uh, or from the US government, um, foreign policies and, and what the like, uh, which I think is, is a unique layer to immigrants that's very specific to us that may not uh, be experienced by other community members. And so really, again, the, the promotoras de salud break down so many of the other barriers that exist for our communities um, you know, it doesn't require any technology. We know that there's a lot of technology gaps that our communities, you know, connectivity challenges our communities are facing as well. Uh, and so being able to do this person to person or even side by side, even if they are helping, for instance, enroll someone in a clinical trial or, or for a vaccine, um, you know, they're able to do that side by side uh, because of those challenges that we have. Um, we have different levels of 
of uh, literacy as well. Um, you know, again, using my own home country as an example, you know, we're square mile wise the size of Tennessee, uh, but we speak 23 different languages. They're not dialects, they're actual individual languages. So for many of the community members, especially those coming from Guatemala, uh, English, Spanish is already their second language. And so adding on a third, um, I wish I would be able to say that I'm trilingual, but I'm not there yet. Um, one thing that we, we did see throughout this pandemic is the introduction of new um, technologies and new um, modalities that our community has been able to use and has really grasped them, uh, especially now that we're you know, a year plus into this pandemic. Um, so the use of you know, virtual platforms, we've done a lot of trainings, which is another way that we've been able to help uh, dispel some of the misinformation that is circulating in our community is really bringing the experts to their homes uh, through a series of you know, virtual town halls uh, or trainings um, with other trusted, uh, especially medical partners um, throughout this pandemic. Uh, Dr. Tapia, which is uh, also uh, at the University of Maryland has done a lot of this uh, vaccine development so that we've partnered with in doing the Moderna trials here uh, at our headquarters has done some of these uh, virtual town halls with us, uh, being able to directly answer um, in their own language the questions that our community members might have. Um, <clears throat> social media is one that our community is very, very uh, familiar with and, and used quite a bit. Uh, another one that is not new to our community, but I think it's new to jurisdiction here, using it to reach our community is WhatsApp. Uh, it's an internet-based texting uh, for those that haven't used it, um, but it's something that we use very commonly to stay in touch with family and friend across the globe. Um, and so since it is such a widely used modality uh, within our community, we have been um, encouraging many jurisdictions or local health departments to also utilize this. I know the city of Annapolis does, um, Montgomery County also does, and it's been super successful to do mass texting uh, to our community in our language using a lot of graphics. Uh, they put together a, a series of PSAs um, and even varied the accents um, as I was mentioning before, you know, a Colombian accent or a Venezuelan accent or a Mexican accent uh, in, the, in the PSA is to really drive home that, that cultural piece. And so it's not just the linguistic, but also the specific cultural pieces. Um, speaking a, a little bit more about, um, you know, who are those trusted messengers? Um, also, media personalities um, are another one. Um, I think the community, you know, having limited uh, outlets, you know, the two main ones being Telemundo and, and Univision um, being the two main ones, they really get to know the reporters and the main anchors here. And so they are really seen as, as local celebrities. Um, the drawback with media is that the sound bites tend to be very short. And so they sensationalize. Um, and it, it also it takes a while for the information to, to get into our community. So I think the misinformation is, is a, an actually a bigger problem in the non-English speaking sectors of our community because by having these delays and getting timely information to those different sectors, we allow more space to be open for um, misinformation to impregnate because I think once misinformation has impregnated, it, that much more work to then dispel that misinformation than to drown it out from the get-go and not give it a space to uh, have those roots in our community. Um, the, the fact that we are using modalities to reach family and friends across the globe um, adds a, a one other piece, I think, to, to the immigrant community specifically, where we're seeing the, the misinformation that's circulating in all of the other countries uh, also here. So, you know, we're, you know, even within my own family, we're getting texts from Spain, from France, from Latin America, from all parts of the, the globe um, that is very much circulating in those parts uh, of, you know, those continents or, or those countries. Um, but we're seeing it here as well. And so it's, it, it adds a whole nother list of, to our 
to-do list um, by not only tackling the misinformation that, that we see circulating here, but also staying up to date and seeing what's circulating in, in many of these other countries, because it is so easy to do this information sharing. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of it coming from Africa over here of mistrust and, and, and of, um, you know, not, you know, what's in this vaccine, not trusting the ingredients, not trusting the manufacturers uh, and the governmental mistrust layers uh, and how that's impregnating and, and causing hesitancy here. And so really being able to be at the front lines of getting the information out in a timely manner that's culturally and linguistically appropriate for all the different sectors of the community has really been the best way to, like I said, flood, flood the, the airwaves, if you, if, uh, for lack of a better term, of um, with all of the credible information, really you know, break it down using trusted sources um, that, that the community can relate to so that misinformation doesn't even get a chance to, to root. And I think my time is up is what they're telling me. So I'll leave it there for the rest in the Q&A. Thank you so much to our fabulous group of speakers. I was realizing I should have added a cognitive scientist to our group. Um, because the cognitive scientists would have reminded us our poor little brains can't handle all of that. These, uh, you know, when Michelle was describing information coming from around the globe, I was just imagining, you know, having a visual image of what that's like when we're have processing so many pieces of information. So now we're going to turn to our Q&A, which Will is going to moderate. Um, that will go on till about 2.20, and then we will wrap up. So Will, I noticed we have our first question in the Q&A. And we would encourage um, all of the participants to post your comments or questions there. And if we don't see any coming in, we will start a conversation among the panelists. So I'll turn it over to you, Will. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Um, we already have five panelists and your first thought is we needed, we needed more people. I love it. Um, no, so I, I, I would urge anyone uh, watching, listening to please send in your questions. Otherwise, you're going to largely get stuck with what I've come up with. Uh, you may not, you may not like that, but we'll we'll start what we have within the queue. Um, how do you suggest addressing the digital divide, such as disparities in internet access that exist in many communities, as we work to create resources that address misinformation and institutional mistrust, mistrust and um, Dr. Turner Lee, I think we'll we'll direct that to, to you to start. Yeah, no, thank you for that question because I get to do a shameless plug of my book, um, which is on the US digital divide. So I'll be coming out with a book later this year on uh, just some travels I did around the country asking communities about their digital access. And the title of the book is Digitally Invisible how the internet is creating the new underclass. And it's really this conversation that we're having it today in terms of modalities, but it's also a conversation on where we failed as a country to ensure that we maintain the social contract for connectivity. And I think for the person who asked that question, I mean, clearly it does uh, challenge us to think about the role of digital access. I mean, prior to the pandemic, when I was actually doing these visits across the country, there was already a digital divide problem. Two weeks into the pandemic, we realized that the problem was much bigger than what we thought. Uh, six months in, we realized that it actually infected areas that were of most importance, like shopping and education, employment, and healthcare. And so now we're at a state where the more than uh, 14 million people who are disconnected from the internet actually look quite different because some of those folks may be housing insecure, uh, service, social service insecure, and now they're broadband insecure. And I think we're gonna see some changes under this administration, but this clearly has an impact on just the perfunctory stuff like scheduling an appointment to get a vaccine to whether or not you can engage in remote healthcare. And so I love what Michelle talked about which is until we get to a state of equity when it comes to digital access. And by that, I mean not just the ability to give people a broadband connection in the home or Wi-Fi connection in the community or a device that is internet enabled, but until we get to a space where it's not just about the connectivity, but it is about cleaving the types of systemic inequalities that leave people behind because they're not connected because they're not connected. And I love Michelle said, listen, when all else fails, we go back to the traditional and we just see people in person. 
And we've got to realize that, you know, Michelle is one in, in, in many <laughs> that is actually trying to figure out how to connect to the lived experiences of communities. And when these communities are not connected uh, and there's no other solution, they are basically invisible and not heard, right? And I would say the last thing is when their data is not represented, particularly in the medical space, they are even further marginalized because we know less about the practices or the behaviors of how that data actually impact, uh, actually affects uh, the reduction of health disparities. So for that person who asked it, I was like, should I talk about this in the beginning? So I wait and see if there's gonna be a question. Will you just made my day because uh, for many years, you know, digital access and divide were not among the conversation of the public health community. And so I'm glad that we're finally seeing that having these enabled devices matter, not just from the enrollment side, but from the continual of providing quality health care. Remote now we could do it, but before, you know, it's just, you know, this, uh, the lack of productivity and the buses that people have to take and everything Michelle said um, can now be enabled through new technologies. Great, thank you. Thought we, I thought we had got another one. It was just, it was just the questioner also thanking you for, for that response. Um, so Kathy, uh, I'm curious as to whether and how um, the last year with the pandemic has has changed the nature of misinformation surrounding vaping. Oh, great question. Um, wow. Yes. I mean, COVID has changed everything, and so why would this be any different? And I think significantly it comes in. Um, we have identified another kind of um, thread of misinformation, and that relates to um, vaping's purported protective qualities associated with COVID. So there has been um, some talk on the internet, so we find it most significantly on Twitter, um, which, which, by the way, is the, the platform that most significantly carries health misinformation, um, that the uh, propylene glycol might actually kill bacteria and viruses. Might is the language that they often use. Um, and that if you hit the microbes right at the you know, perfect time, you might prevent, some, you know, someone might be prevented from, uh, from getting COVID. And that actually made the rounds to the degree that pub, the public health community felt that they had to respond to this and make clear that there was no data, no evidence, no science to suggest. So trying to get out that, that counter message um, associated with it, because at the same time as this messaging is going out, we know lots of vapors, people who vape are also still smokers. We call them dual users. Um, so a significant uh, chunk of folks who are vaping are also still smoking. And we know that the impact of COVID on smokers is much more acute and can be much more devastating from a health perspective. So the last thing we needed was people thinking, I'm gonna vape more while they're still smoking, not being protected from COVID obviously, and then suffering you know, kind of those uh, deeper consequences. So COVID hasn't spared any of us um, even with the misinformation around vaping. Great, thank you, Kathy. So what is, I'm gonna open this up to, we got another question in the chat box. I'm gonna open this up to everybody. What is the best approach for the average person like me that would like to dispel conspiracy theories and misinformation in discussions with friends and family? So what, what can everybody watching and will do to, to try and combat this? Somebody's gonna bite. I'll bite. <laughs> Um, well, a lot of the research has found that um, the most trusted source for the majority of the community is their primary care provider. Um, so I would refer to anyone who does have health insurance that that's where they should go um, if they do have any questions. The problem is that over 80% of our community or the community that I serve do not have health insurance. So where can they go to dispel these questions and, and uh, these uh, hesitancies that they may be experiencing? Um, that's where um, uh, their religious backgrounds come more into play. Many of them turn to their pastors, turn to other community leaders, uh, and which is a big reason of why we are hosting so many of these virtual town halls um, and community meetings uh, in lieu of doing them in person, but being able to be that um, 
substitute for that that very intimate conversation that you should and would be able to have if you could afford to uh, with your primary care provider. Uh, we are leaning a lot on our community clinics because many of our community clinics do have uh, the linguistic and cultural competency to be able to serve our community, at least from this perspective of who I serve. Um, I'll jump in on the, um, I love that question because at the end of the day, I mean, one of the ways that we talk about at Brookings how to fight misinformation is to have trusted ambassadors. And oftentimes the trusted ambassadors are not people who are from the community or people that you trust, like your uh, pastor or your grandmother or somebody else like that, that people have to realize where is the message coming from. Uh, when you looked at, for example, some of the COVID um, anti-vaccination stuff, it was coming from, for the least of black community, diamond and silk. And if you've ever heard from Diamond and Silk, I don't think you'd want to trust what they have to say, just because that, again, is not necessarily a trusted source or ambassador for information. I would also say when it comes to misinformation, one way, you know, given the fact that the algorithmic is so strong, is that people have to talk about it, right? They've got to talk about it and they've got to challenge it. Um, if there is something that you feel that you hear, and, and many social media companies are now doing these flags, why am I seeing this? This is not true, or check this. I mean, I know I'm a victim. I often share like the obituaries of, uh, of, of gospel stars or R&B stars that died like 10 years ago. And somebody will say, did you look at the date? And a lot of times the misinformation is spread, right? Because people are not looking at the date because we live in sort of this uh, sharing economy now where we share information, whether or not it's true or false, and then we kind of have to backtrack. But one of the things that's so interesting that I find, for example, in COVID, is that we are now having many of these trusted sources, Dr. Fauci, uh, the young woman who is the African-American lead on um, the vaccination effort, really speaking out and telling people, you know, this is, this is not true. This is a conspiracy theory, and this is why you have to be vaccinated. And I think that may be one way to do it. The unfortunate side to the person at the question is that in many respects, our families are polarized by our politics and community and our backgrounds and our beliefs. And until we start to get a little closer to that uh, uh, sort of harmonization of just some general values, it may be more difficult to actually avert that, but at least start with trusted sources. Um, I know for a fact, I'm always like arguing with my 14 year old about misinformation <laughs> because she tends to know about conspiracy theories that I'm like, that's not true until, you know, we have these drawn out conversations. So for family and friends, you have to keep talking about it uh, because right now there's no way for us to recalibrate these discussions in a world where most of our media is, is found online. Yeah. And um, speaking personally for the, for the cannabis space, one of the primary functions of the commission is, you know, what we always call education. You know, th this, is an, this is an area that there's so much that's unknown and what's out there is from the industry, from dispensary agents and, and from users largely. And so, so trying to sift through that and provide uh, you know, the, the truth and a reliable message, most recently with, with this issue with Delta 8 of you know, letting our, our state agency partners, you know, talking, reaching out to the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health and saying, are you guys aware of this? What are you, what are you doing with it? And then getting a message out to, to the public. Um, so that's that's really central to, to our work, and, and I think what a large measure that's trying to combat a lot of the misinformation that we see in this space. Um, I, I kind of want to build off this a little bit and, and go to you, Gunther, if we can, because I, I saw that you had that first article in 2002. So you've been looking at this for, for a while. I'm curious as to what what drew you here in the first place, and if you have any but, you know, we, we've been sort of been talking about solutions. If you have anything to build off of what's already been uh, brought up. Yeah, I've been actually studying this field for even longer. So in, in the mid 90s, when the web came up, right, there was a lot of concern. What is the world web going to do with uh, health information? Should this be regulated and so on? So and I was actually leading a EU funded project to study this and also to study potential uh, potential measures um, which are not which were like technology based measures so what we were thinking about is kind of develop some sort of an immune system against infodemics with with uh, metadata 
So the idea was whenever somebody would visit the website, the browser would in the background retrieve metadata, what are other sources saying about the source. Um, there are organizations out there which are still around, like the Health on the Net Foundation, which kind of certify uh, uh, information. So that, that, that was one attempt. We were trying to build a kind of a decentralized system where we kind of aggregate what, what do other people say about a certain information provider. Um, th that project um, did not really catch on for a variety of reasons. One of them is the lack of a business model for this kind of uh, metadata, right? Because, um, um, yeah, I don't want to go too much into detail, but so this this was the origin of this. We, we were thinking a lot about misinformation on the internet. Can we and should we combat this? Um, and um, so, yeah, that, that this problem has not only occurred during COVID-19, so this is, um, has just been put in the spotlight. Uh, spotlight. I, I just wanted to go back to the question on what what can the average consumer do? And I, I think there are, it, it depends a little bit on what the cause of the misinformation is. And I think there are at least like four different causes why there is misinformation out there. So one, uh, one potential cause is that there's just lack of consensus within the scientific community about what is correct and what is incorrect. So for example, I'm aware of another study where they looked at what domains are have the highest prevalence of misinformation. And in that study, nutrition came up as, as the highest, uh, as the, the domain with the highest prevalence of misinformation. And I, I explained this by that there is also little consensus out there on certain questions like what is the most effective diet to lose weight? So you ask 10 different nutritionists and you get 10 different answers. So it is very hard to come up with a gold standard. Then there are there are other reasons for why there's misinformation is that there are biases, there are commercial interests, there are political interests, and, uh, and, and sometimes a, a topic is just prone to misunderstandings and, and that may be another uh, cause for misinformation. So it all depends how to react to misinformation on what the cause is. And if the cause is, for example, a commercial or political biases, then um, uh, there, there should be an attempt to uncover this, to look at the source of the information, to look at why, why is the information presented in a biased way. So, Will, can I just add on to that? Because Gunther and I actually met like 20 something years ago on, on this whole information quality issue. And, you know, one of the other things for, that research has shown is that just like in many other areas of our lives, we overestimate our ability to evaluate information. And so we, we think we are looking at multiple sources. We think we are verifying. We think we are choosing the best sources. And so that effect that, you know, that um, uh, overestimation of our abilities to evaluate information is another dimension to this problem that I think we don't have good answers to either. Right, and we actually published a study on that in the PMJ about 25 years ago, where we asked consumers first, like, what do you do to distinguish or what do you do when you look at health information on the internet and then they told us things like yeah I check the source etc all the things that that consumers think they're doing but then we put them into a usability lab and we gave them a, them a task to to retrieve information about a certain health topic and we observed what they actually what they are how they actually navigated and and did they actually check the about us page of a website, for example, and we interviewed them later, we asked them what, what was the answer to this health question we gave you, and do you remember where you got this information from? And, and, and we observed that they did not check the source and they did not remember who the source, they remembered the answer to the, to the question we gave them, but they did not, they could not tell us where that information came from, which is there's this paradox that people know what they should be doing, but in practice, they are not doing it. 
And that's obviously uh, even more difficult in social media when you get a tweet with, with, a, with a headline and you just blindly reshare this without, without like going through the effort to actually digging deeper and, and, and look where that information is coming from or how it originated. So yeah, that's certainly that divide between what consumers think they should be doing or what, what they think they are doing and what they actually do. Great, thank you. Switching gears a little bit, we, we got a question uh, topical about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And since Dr. Fauci and the CDC's infectious disease team are not with us, I don't want to be spreading any misinformation. So the, the, question, the question is very specific about, you know, what, what's the truth here regarding the blood clots and the pause. And so I, I don't think we should be answering that. Um, and I, I would direct, given the expertise that you all have provided, I would direct folks to reliable sources. So, you know, go to the go to CDC's website uh, and the like. But I wonder if we can can springboard off of this for where, uh, and it was something Gunther was just getting to a little bit, of where there is no certainty. Um, what, what, what it then? I mean, when, when we have competing information, um, how best to, to sift through that? I don't know if anyone has any additional thoughts on that. I mean, I want to say with respect to the vaccine, you're right, well, don't listen to me um, on uh, why they paused and they just paused, they didn't pull. Um, but this is what creates such a, I actually talked about this with my class this morning. I said, you know, what do you, what's your takeaway from this? And it really was the importance of two things and, oh, you know, it's on both ends of the spectrum. The, the public health messaging, how are they communicating to the community about what they're doing and why, right? Oh, the J&J &J vaccine is being pulled. No, it's being paused. But what does that mean? I don't know what that means, right? So I'm not gonna tell you what I think it means. And so the importance of the messaging that, um, that, that public health officials here, you know, government officials, should really be engaging and thinking through how they're communicating to individuals, particularly in such a high stakes realm like this. At the other end of the spectrum is Cynthia's first love of health literacy is how are we preparing our community to receive these messages? And it's really tough to do it in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of the crisis. And so we, while we need to work on, you know, public health messaging, taking into consideration um, you know, the literacy uh, attainment of the community, we also need to work on improving health literacy in the community. Now that doesn't necessarily get to the, the myths and disinformation involved in there, you know, push back on both of those things. But I think for this particular issue, um, both the communication from the federal government about what they're doing and why um, hasn't necessarily been as, you know, effective as it could have been at the same time, I don't know if we're all just so tired of having to hear about um, what's next in COVID and um, how long these vaccines are even going to last and, you know, whether they're going to start being required for travel and work and passports that people just can't even receive or if, you know, our health literacy at this point, we, we've achieved a level of health literacy and we need more. Um, we need improved health literacy in our community to understand this messaging. Because if we're right, if, if I'm right that the, you know, the federal government's just saying, hey, we're gonna take a little pause. We're gonna look into these instances because we don't wanna see any more of them. But, you know, it's entirely possible. We're gonna say, nope, everything is fine. Who have they lost um, as a result of taking that break? And, um, you know, why are we as a, as a community not willing to accept that they might need to take a break? And that's a good thing. That means the regulators are working, <laughs> doing their job and protecting us. And if they made that determination and they make the determination to return J&J, &J, if they do, that we can trust that. So I don't know if any of what I just said made sense, but that was kind of the outcome of my chatting about this with my class today. And the well, dog just I, I got it, I got it, order. Kathy, but we worked together for a lot of years. So <laughs> That's I don't know true. That I'm the best, best example. Um, building off that, we did get a question from uh, a practitioner experiencing burnout, like I think many of us are trying to combat misinformation. Um, and it, it talks, it's getting, the question is getting at the health literacy, Kathy, that you just brought up. and. Um, so do you think that information consumption literacy is largely at fault? What can we do, if anything, the primary school curricula to address uh, this issue? So, you know, is there something that we can do at a young age? How do we do this? Cynthia, this is an area you worked on a bunch. I don't know if you have any, any thoughts. 
Um, so many thoughts, I guess, how to distill that into sort of a short thing. I mean, sure, the, it, it, the ideal model would be, you know, from the very beginning, we're living with other humans that model good behavior and we're exposed to the best information sources and we figure out how to overcome our cognitive biases and we don't have limited information processing capacities, right? All those things would be fabulous, right? But that's not how we're built. That's not how our societies operate. So I think, you know, I, I don't think there is a good answer right now. As Gunther indicated, you know, we've got good research going back a couple of decades now about, um, you know, in these digital environments, how challenged we are to really sort through. Not If you think back, I mean, we just had websites, you know, the, what, what Gunther was referencing was when we just had websites and now we have so many other digital channels and people were still challenged then. So I would say, you know, this is supposed to be a panel to stimulate research. So I really hope our graduate students are listening out there and getting good ideas for their capstone projects and their dissertations and things like that, because I don't think I have an answer yet about how we quote combat this. I think there's just too many pieces. Oh, you know, we've had a great you know, perspective uh, or range of perspectives here, but there's still many more perspectives to why we're in the situation we are now. So um, that's kind of a long winded way of saying, I think this is just what, what I hope this panel has done is really suggested new ideas for research and new collaborations, because that is what Public Health Research Day is supposed to suggest is bring together people who wouldn't normally have this conversation and start thinking about where the new research could, could happen, whether it's in partnership with Michelle and the community she works with, or, you know, working with sociologists like Nicole, or working with the lawyers like you and, and Kathy, it's just opening a, up a whole bunch of avenues, I hope, for people thinking about these questions in a more rich way. Tara's telling us we're out of time and to, to transition to closing remarks. I think that's what was just happening, if you just yeah. want to build on that a little bit. Sure, I just, I mean, if there's um, just, maybe I'll take advantage of the, the closing remark position and maybe in just a few seconds, if each of our panelists could say like one takeaway from, for them, like one, what is one thing that you're taking away from the conversation we've had here today? So Nicole, you're in the upper left for me, I'll start with you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think this conversation sort of uh, demonstrates just how hard this question is, Cynthia, like you said, but more importantly, the role of policymakers like myself to ensure that we properly define what misinformation is, uh, put in place guardrails that sort of limit the ability of, of either foreign operatives or individuals that want to sort of sow this kind of discord to take advantage of these platforms. And that's really, in my work, uh, from a regulatory standpoint and from a legislative standpoint, there has to be a commission on misinformation and hate speech in this country to be able to get at its its influence on very important information when it comes to health. Um, and, and so I would just close here. I think for people who are studying this, we traditionally have been siloed by our disciplines, sociology, public health, but now we're seeing just how important it is to understand the role and ways in which technologies work to actually get at some of the vulnerabilities and to continue persistent um, inequalities. And so, you know, I, I can't leave here as positive from the standpoint that we're going to combat it like others have said, all I can suggest, like Michelle, who's working on the ground every day, is that the more we let this go unhinged, the more likely we're going to see the same people targeted over and over again to suppress their ability to get access to uh, the same rights as others when it comes to their health care. Gunther, your takeaway from our conversation. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm more convinced than ever that all these potential technological solutions only go so far and that the key to all this is really to build e-health literacy. So e-health hey. lit <laughs> e literacy um, what was a concept that was defined in, in 2006 in a, in a seminal paper in the Law of Medical Internet Research and uh, the author said that e-health literacy is basically a blend of other forms of literacy. So there's the traditional literacy, there's computer literacy, there's media literacy, there's science literacy, there's information literacy, there's health literacy. And, uh, and um, yesterday I even learned a new term, it's, it's called advertising literacy, which is 
people understand what are the commercial interests behind uh, behind uh, an ad or, or even a sponsored app and all that. So all this really is is all about uh, consumer education, and and uh, to me this is the only viable way forward. Um, I mean, there are also techn technological solutions one may look into or regulatory um, uh, measures. I, I think even, even Facebook is now asking to be regulated and, and that is, is certainly also a potential avenue, but e-health literacy is, is, is the way to go. Okay, great. Kathy, your takeaway from our conversation. And quick, okay. I'm gonna have to ask you guys to be like one minute or less. Real quick, um, I will just pick up on something that Nicole said, and that was to the, that the silos are damaging. Um, I'm a big believer in interprofessional education. Cynthia knows that. I work on an IPE project with her, and I think we could be better about that as professionals. And so we should all be working collaboratively to better understand the dynamics so that we can push back against us. We're not going to be able to solve this with the statute. That's not going to happen. So we're going to have to work a little bit harder and collaboratively to get there. Hey, I endorse that wholeheartedly. So Michelle, your takeaway from our conversation. Um, I'm very encouraged. I love to see how much we're, we're dissecting this um, and how much is being studied from different perspectives uh, and, and really hopefully seeing the, you know, the end result uh, with the boots on the ground on, on my end um, and really seeing how, you know, technology is, is a double-edged sword. You know, it, it, it lets us get into people's homes and and, and reach out and touch people across the globe, but uh, also brings in uh, new challenges and, and new misinformation. All right, co-moderator Will, your, your takeaway from our conversation. Uh, not to hang out with Gunther and Nicole. I'm terrified <laughs> for the future. No, um, I, I shockingly agree with, with Kathy here on, um, on getting rid of those silos and particularly as someone who's a regulator and also um, a liaison for other uh, policymakers with the General Assembly is is begging, you know, researchers to to share your information with us so that you know we we can effectuate the the necessary policy change. Um, it's it's often I'm 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 begging for types of you know information for things and, and not getting it. So please connect with folks. This is this is you know together is how is how we move this forward. Great. So my last job is I'm supposed to have a slide to uh, do the thank yous and also transition you to um, our keynote speaker who follows us, who will also be talking about misinformation um, and uh, the role of various industries uh, you know, that have been alluded to already. So again, thank you very much for joining our panel, our discussion today, for your questions and your comments. Um, and following us today at three o'clock is Dr. David Michaels, who is epidemiologist and professor at uh, GW, GWU School of Public Health, and he will be talking about rebuilding and reimagining our public health infrastructure. Um, I'm getting a message from Dushanka that says this panel has heard of multidisciplinary approaches to today's most wicked problem. So many questions still to answer while we continue to practice what we know. Thank you. So thank you everyone. And the last thing I'm gonna ask of you is to complete the evaluation. So each, the evaluations are by session. So please let us know what you thought of today's conversation uh, and this as a topic and what you'd like to see going forward. So thank you very much for your time and attention and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>